Here we see a pyramid view of the data-driven decision-making process. And we start at the bottom and work our way up. So data science can both support and overlap the whole data-driven decision-making process because part of it happens through regular data processing as well. But certainly we're finding more and more capabilities where data analytics and data science plays a role as well, okay? So we start off with your data processing, your, your data engineering in the ERPs. You've got your data warehouses that uh, companies, most companies are building data warehouses now, and a few have started building uh, data lakes or collecting data lakes, uh, where basically you have the data just sitting around very much uh, in its almost raw form ready for people to use. We're applying uh, data science to work on those type one decisions. So these are the things like Walmart and the hurricanes. We're finding out new things that we never knew before and taking action to make better decisions there. Also the type two, these are the decisions that happen, you know, thousands or maybe even millions of times a day that it, uh, we can automate and gain efficiencies in. So these are the things that repeat over and over and over again. And a small incremental improvement can be huge in such decisions. So type one, type two decisions. And then you can see the data-driven decision-making uh, sort of in a cloud up there leading uh, throughout the whole company. So we talked about the Walmart hurricane uh, being type one decisions. What about the target pregnancy? What kind of a decision do you think that might be? Might be. Uh, what about customer churn in the telco industry or in uh, credit cards? Uh, you know, credit card uh, companies want you to stay with them. They like collecting their fees and, of course, their interests, interest rates and charges from you, uh, if possible. So they'd like to keep you from switching uh, as long as you're profitable to them. Also, some of the streaming services we've talked about. So an MIT Wharton study indicates that when controlling, even when controlling for potentially co confounding variables, an improvement of just one standard deviation over the mean value or the mean level of data-driven decision-making used in an organization can be associated with about a four, and, and this is a very likely causal association with a four to six percent increase in productivity or ROA, ROE, asset utilization, market value, things like that. So we already have a lot of these decisions automated, targeted marketing, credit card loan approvals, Amazon, Netflix recommendations, things like that. And it's a point of going forward from there and employing data-driven decision-making in new areas. So that's where you're going to fit in into your firms. And you can see down there at the bottom, we still enjoy all the other benefits, uh, the efficiencies, streamlining, and so forth of uh, just plain old data processing through our ERPs and other legacy systems. All right. So big data, a lot of companies are still working on what we might call big data 1.0. And here we can think back to uh, the internet and web-based uh, internet usage, which uh, we have uh, classified, and some people may say we're even in Web 3.0 by now, but Web 1.0 was basically just getting an internet presence up there, getting yourself on the web and, and doing something useful. And in those days, the, we're talking the early to mid-90s, uh, we had companies like Netscape, Yahoo, and then uh, AOL kind of dominated the internet traffic. And those were the sites people went to. So Web 2.0 is when companies figured out how to leverage uh, some of the other aspects of web, the web, the interactivity, the social aspects of it. So we started seeing, you know, Google, Amazon, eBay come up uh, as they started figuring out ways to make the web more useful for you. And we'll see deeper integration of data and analytics uh, in companies top to bottom 
as we move toward Big Data 2.0. So Big Data 1.0, again, is just sort of figuring out how to get Big Data in place and start making some decisions. Big Data 2.0 is incorporating data analytics and the data analytics aspect of decision, data-driven decision, uh, into the whole organization. And again, just like we saw with uh, Web 2.0, some companies are going about it faster and getting into it faster than others. Again, Amazon sticks out in as, as an example, and we could see Facebook, um, uh, companies like that, Netflix, though these types of companies are making great use of data and data analytics. So this whole shift to data analytics introduces that notion of having data anal analytics as a capability that companies need to develop and nurture. So if we look at kind of the size of data and we think about ERPs and ERPs represent, this is a, a chart I got from EY, uh, this ERPs represent just that yellow portion of the data that's out there. And you can think about the thousands or even millions of transactions and other data records that are in an ERP. And we're just scratching the surface of being able to analyze data in companies uh, with this uh, very structured and formatted transactional data that's in the ERPs. So we get into uh, additional operational systems, uh, maintenance logs, uh, details of uh, CRMs, call centers, uh, even email. We get into the web data, other data from sensors, uh, click streams, uh, RFID, uh, geo tracking, all kinds of things that are out there. And so you can see the universe of data is humongous. And of course, we get studies like this all the time, but uh, this uh, study from the National Association of Corporate Directors says the data going into the internet now every second is equivalent to the data data that was in the entire internet 20 years ago or so. So I've heard other um, takes on this where the uh, amount of data created in one day uh, now is greater than the amount of data that was created in all of human history up to you know, 15, 20 years ago. So you'll hear lots of stats like that. And being able to get our arms around that data and figure out what to do with it is one of the two key assets that are differentiators for companies these days. So those capabilities we were talking about, yeah, you need the data. Well, there's tons of data out there. Companies can collect data, they can buy data, they can get free data. Uh, there's all kinds of data out there, but you have to have the capabilities in place to be able to use that data. And you also have to have the right data to answer the business questions that you're trying to tackle. So these are two complementary assets. Obviously, I can have the best capabilities in the world, but if I don't have the right data, so what? And vice versa. So how do you go about getting the data if you don't have it? Well, you can see what Signet Bank did. Uh, they went ahead and uh, created it at great cost over a long period of time. How many companies do you think would be willing to take that approach? And as you see, as you work your way through the readings, uh, a couple years ago, there was uh, an estimated shortage of 1.5 million managers with good data analytics thinking skills. So not even a full-blown data scientist or a, a, an algorithm guru, but just managers that know how to handle data analytics and the data analytics process. Walmart just last year uh, announced they were going to hire 1,500 data analysts. So that brings us to this, well, how do we become a good data analytics manager? How do we develop that analytic attitude, or you can think of it as data analytic thinking? So we need to be able to ask the key questions. So business knowledge and understanding the problem domain is always crucial. Next, you need to know how to get the data. 
And in many cases, this is going to involve what we call ETL, extract, transform, and load. And you also hear this called uh, data prep, uh, uh, data migration, um, data um, transformation, data scrubbing, or even data wrangling. So getting the data, getting it in a format that you can use for the problem that you're trying to solve uh, is a key part. There are estimates that this was uh, something that took up 80 or maybe even 90% of data analytics processes not too long ago. The, that's quickly changing as the tools are developing very quickly automated data transformation uh, capabilities that help you out and uh, kind of eliminate that whole grunt work part of data analytics. So um, it's good to know and have an idea of how the transformation, data transformation process will work, but uh, that problem is going to continue to get easier and easier. Um, just as a reference point, I managed a team of, uh, uh, of data transformation uh, experts at our software company uh, years ago whose sole job was to go to go around and uh, work on projects and help get data into the tools. Then being able to figure out which analytic techniques make sense for the business problem at hand. And then again, be the, this is a bit key part of existing business analysts being able to interpret and share results with the key stakeholders in a way that makes sense to them, in a way that speaks to them, uh, and in a way that uh, uh, makes the best use of the capabilities you have. Okay, so data analytic thinking, you, the ability to kind of put this all together in a good package. So we think about data science, and one of the first fundamental concepts of data science is, well, we need to be able to extract useful knowledge from the data we have available. We need to be able to solve business problems, and we can use, uh, we can approach this systematically by following a, a well-defined process. Crisp DM is the one that we'll talk about in this class, and you can see a a uh, picture of uh, a diagram of it right here. We'll get into that later on. Uh, but this is similar to the audit methodology you may have talked about in your audit class. Just having a process where you understand what needs to take place, how it works, how the process uh, happens. Other fundamental processes, uh, concepts, well, from a big batch of data, we can use IT to find and help us discover new things, uh, help us uh, find those new insights. Third, if we look too hard at data, sure, we will find something. Uh, that's called overfitting. Uh, you may have talked about this before. We'll get into it as well in this class. So, uh, and also the rule of large numbers comes into play here. If you've got a sample size that's big enough, you'll have a statistically significant finding uh, for just about everything you're looking at. So uh, we, in data analytics, we've kind of stepped back away from some of those p-value, t-value type uh, uh, significance values we've uh, thought about in the past because when you're looking at gigantic amounts of numbers, uh, quantities of uh, data, uh, those p-values get very significant in a hurry. And then finally, being able to develop a good solution and figure out what the results actually mean, uh, means that we have to understand the context. So again, the, having the domain knowledge, the business knowledge, or the business process, or the industry knowledge uh, comes into play. So all of that is still important uh, with regards to what we do in data analytics. And that brings me to a note on tools. Yeah, we're gonna use specific tools during this course. These are the tools of the day. Um, but it's important to 
not get yourself too hung up on the tool itself, but make sure you understand what's going on uh, with the process. Tools come and go. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, KPMG right now is transitioning from Tableau to Power BI as their data visualization tool of choice throughout the organization. So yeah, Tableau, uh, you, you might be using Tableau your first year, and then all of a sudden next year, they'll hand you Power BI and take away Tableau. Real similar tools, they do almost the same things. Uh, they do them slightly differently, but if you understand what you're trying to accomplish, you can uh, jump into either tool and get it done. So keep that in mind. Tools we see and use two, two years down the road, five years down the road, 10 years down the road are gonna look uh, different, may even be completely different tools. Uh, one exception to that is probably going to be Excel, but even that, the Excel I'm using today looks and works and behaves and has a lot of differences from the Excel I used five years ago and certainly 15 years ago. I've been using Excel for more than 30 years, so uh, you can imagine uh, it's gone through quite a few changes. So the concepts, way more important than the tools. Yeah, you'll have to get good enough with the tools to get done what you need done, but um, um, be sure you understand the concepts. All right, so that's it for this video. I hope you found it uh, interesting, and we will see you next time.